Hi everyone, Dave Prouse once again. Here's a video on analyzing CompTIA A plus 220-902 sample questions. Like the 220-901 video, I'll discuss my approach toward exam questions, taking it step by step. Here's a couple of things to remember when studying and taking the real exam. First, read through the entire question carefully. Next, look at all the answers. Know why the correct answer is correct, but also why the incorrect answers are incorrect. When studying, reverse engineer the question and consider flashcards. And when taking the real exam, use the process of elimination if necessary. And we'll review these during the first question. Remember that these are sample questions, and while they are not exactly what you will see on the real exam, they are similar conceptually. Let's begin. Question 1. Which of the following Windows tools is the best to use when analyzing a system's RAM usage? Well, we want to analyze the question. We want to make sure that we're looking at everything in the question. For example, here it says, Windows tools, and systems RAM usage. So watch for the key phrases and key words when you're looking at these questions. Really analyze the question before you even go into the uh, possible answers. And so the possible answers for this are A, MS Config, B, Event Viewer, C, Task Manager, and D, Command Prompt. These are all Windows applications, but you have to select the right one for analyzing the system's RAM usage. Now, most of the time, you'll get multiple choice questions like this, which have four possible answers. Sometimes you'll get one with more. You might have E and F and G, but in this case, it's four possible answers. And the correct answer here is going to be the task manager. That's where we're going to go to analyze a system's RAM usage. There's other places you can go in Windows as well, but uh, the task manager is the best answer of the listed answers here. So let's bring up that task manager now. And you can see I'm in the Windows task manager. This is actually on a Windows 7 computer, but it's similar on 8 and 10 and Windows Vista and whatever. We're at the performance tab, and you can see here the CPU usage which is uh, pretty massive on this system because I have a lot of things running. And you can see the memory usage. And so we can analyze here the amount of memory that's being used, 5.6 gigabytes, of a total physical memory, which is uh, 16 gig on this system. And you can see how much, uh, how much memory is cached, how much is available, and how much is free, and what the system is using. And if you want to find out more about individual applications or processes and how much memory those are using, you can go to the Processes tab or the Applications tab. It'll depend on the version of Windows. Here we go to the Processes tab, and we can see all the memory that's being used, and you can sort that by column header. And you can see I'm running Pro Tools on this system, and it's using 267 megabytes of RAM. Uh, Camtasia, 150 megabytes of RAM, and so on down the line. So you can see I'm using a lot of RAM for these applications, and you may need to analyze that. Maybe there's a bottleneck here. Maybe you're using too much RAM, uh, or maybe there's a problem with the CPU. So, and you can kind of see, you can look for little uh, jumps or spikes in the memory, or especially in the CPU. And this is a great place to go to analyze these types of things. See how much memory is being used by the system in general and by individual processes or applications. So task manager is going to be the right answer. And so remember the points we said in the beginning of the video. You want to read through the entire question carefully. Like I said, check those key phrases and key words. And then look at all the answers. You know, the task manager is the answer. You might have known that right off the bat. But you still want to read through all the answers, just in case the test is trying to trick you or there's something that you missed. So you want to know why this answer is correct, and we showed that, but you also want to know why the incorrect answers are incorrect. So here we have MS Config. 
That's the system configuration utility. You can get to this by going to the run prompt and typing msconfig. And you can see here, what this does is it allows you to modify how the system starts up. Normal startup, diagnostic startup, or you can load specific services from here. In older versions of Windows, you can change the startup apps when the OS starts up. Uh, newer versions of Windows, you'll do this in the task manager. You can also change, uh, you can access safe boot mode uh, and so on. You can go to advanced options and select how many processors will be used. So you can do a lot of debugging here as well. And uh, you have additional tools. You can launch uh, lots of the things that you might work with uh, in the system. And the task manager actually is one of these. So indirectly, MS config is kind of a correct answer, but it's not what I would go to autom you know, right off the bat. I would use the task manager directly, either by you know, doing it from the run prompt or right clicking on the taskbar or doing a control shift escape or whatever. But you can run lots of tools from here as well. So system configuration utility allows you to run tools, but also modify how the system starts up. And that's the main thing, what services are running and how it boots. And if you're doing safe boot. So that's going to be MS config. The next one was event viewer. And the event viewer is where you would go to analyze system logs. And I'll bring that up. You can now open that from the administrative tools, or you can go to the run prompt and type event vwr.msc. And from here, you'll see the Windows logs. And you can look at each of these, like the application log. And we've got some errors there, which I should look into. And the security log, very important for auditing. And also the system log. We do have some errors there as well. Windows module, modules installer service terminated. And so I have some issues on this system. Nothing that's really uh, that important for this particular computer. This is just what I'm recording videos on. If this was a system in the workplace, you'd want to look into these errors and uh, see what the problem is. So you want to look at your system, your application log, and your security log the most often when you're using the event viewer. And you can see here, you can see who did what and when, and in the system and application logs, you can see what happened to the operating system and when, or what happened to applications that run within the operating system and when. So that's the event viewer. And then, of course, you have the command prompt, and you can open that from the uh, start menu or from a variety of other places. You could go to run and type CMD, and that's your uh, command line interface. And you can find some information about RAM from there but not nearly as much as you would in the task manager. And the task manager is graphic as well. It's got that GUI, so it's easier to analyze what's happening on the system. So that's question one. Now, the other points we were talking about, you want to uh, try, when you're studying, you can try reverse engineering the question. And you could do this by writing down on a piece of paper. You could say, the task manager has many responsibilities, including analyzing a system's RAM usage. And this kind of helps you to commit the information to memory. You're kind of reverse engineering the question by stating a definition of the task manager and then stating that portion of the question. Uh, you could also consider using flashcards. Uh, there's, you could do it on paper, you could do it on actual uh, index cards, or you could use a flashcard program from the internet and you could type in the question here, but not any of the answers. You could also, if you're going through one of my books, uh, you could just cover up the answers with a piece of paper and do it in flashcard mode. This way you'd say, okay, which of the following Windows tools is the best to use when analyzing a system's RAM usage? And you just have to come up with the correct answer. And so you'd have to know that that's task manager without even looking at these uh, possible answers. So that makes it a little more difficult to get the right answer. And uh, this really, again, helps you to commit this information to memory more. Now, when taking the real exam, this was the last point. We said you want to use POE or the process of elimination. And so sometimes you might not be sure of what the correct answer is. In this case, you probably were. You'd probably be pretty good with the task manager. But what if you weren't? 
then you could look at the incorrect answers and eliminate ones that are definitely incorrect. You know, the command prompt is definitely incorrect. That's not the first place you'd go to analyze a system's RAM usage. So right off the bat, you could eliminate that. And that just leaves you with three possible answers. You could even write down on the piece of paper when you're taking the exam uh, that D is no good. It's either going to be A, B, or C. And then you might say, well, looking at the three MS config, eh, that deals with system startup. It doesn't really deal with looking at RAM usage and eliminate that one. And then you have two left. And you might say, okay, I don't really remember the event viewer, but I think the task manager might be right. So now you can do an educated guess uh, based on what you've already eliminated. And so that might make it a little easier for you also. So consider that process of elimination, that disprove theory, if you will. And so that's question one. And we'll go a little faster through the uh, rest of the questions now. Question two, a customer explains that a folder containing critical business files is missing from his computer. The customer states that the folder was definitely there yesterday. You view the properties of the parent folder and see a backup listed in the prior versions tab. Based on the CompTIA six-step troubleshooting process, which of the following should you do next? So this is a long scenario-based question, but really it's all going to break down to that CompTIA six-step troubleshooting process. You need to know this for the field. You need to know it for the exam. So we want to know what we should do next based on this process. And if you know the process, then you probably know the answer. So let's look at the possible answers. A is establish a plan of action and implement the solution. Well, that sounds a little bit premature. B, establish a theory of probable cause. That looks good for now. C, verify full system functionality. Also looks premature. And D, document findings, actions, and outcomes. Again, that looks premature as well. That's the last step of the troubleshooting process. Now, we've already identified the problem. We know that there are critical business files missing. The folder was there yesterday. It's not there today. You don't see it inside the parent folder. So we know the problem. We've identified the problem. The data is missing. So the next step in the troubleshooting theory is going to be to establish a theory of probable cause. Why did it happen? Was the folder deleted? Was it removed for some reason? Uh, was it a virus? Was it something uh, due to a backup or a system restore? We don't know exactly. We need to figure that out. And this question doesn't really want you to know what the answer is. It just wants you to be able to explain what you would do next based on the six-step troubleshooting process. And so again, that's going to be to establish a theory of probable cause. You need to know this process. If you haven't done it already, you should download the uh, CompTIA A plus 220-902 exam objectives. And that's a PDF you get from CompTIA's website. And there's details on my website as well. Uh, when you do that, you'll get this whole big document and you'll see objective 5.5. Given a scenario, explain the troubleshooting theory. And it gives you the list here. One, identify the problem, which we did in the question. In the scenario, we figured out already, hey, the data is missing. The folder's not there. Two, establish a theory of probable cause. Question the obvious. Why did it happen? Three, test the theory to determine cause. See if our theory is correct. And if so, move on to step four. Establish a plan of action to resolve the problem and implement the solution, which may be doing a system restore or restoring the information from backup. You don't know. You don't know until we find out exactly what uh, the, the actual cause of the problem was. Five, verify full system functionality. Make sure all the data is there and that the user is satisfied. And six, document findings, actions, and outcomes. Always document what you're doing here. So make sure you download these objectives and make sure you memorize this six-step A-plus troubleshooting theory. And that way you'll be able to answer these questions. What to do next uh, based on a particular problem? Now, what exactly happened here? We're not sure, but we could look into it a little bit. You could look into the parent folder a little further. You know, for example, we could go to a, a test folder. I made a test folder called custom uh, customer parent folder. 
we'll right click on that and go to properties and then we'll go to the previous versions tab now if an admin or the user had done a system restore previously this folder may have been backed up and it's part of what's known as shadow copy um, in Windows 7 in newer versions it's uh, the functionality of shadow copy is there but you don't actually use shadow copy you're just dealing with file history and system restore but anyways um, you if you do a system restore point you may have an older version of the folder or subfolders listed here and that may or the parent folder may be listed here and that may include the older version of that subfolder and you could restore that from here or you could do it from windows backup or you could do it with a system restore so it all depends on what the problem is which folder is missing uh and from which date you want to get it back from so you know it all depends on a lot of factors before you actually implement the solution but this is where you could go to find out more information about that so there's a little bit about the uh, a plus six-step troubleshooting process and that's question two we'll move on to question three a turnstile is an example of which type of physical security so this time we have a real short question looks a little bit easier a turnstile and a turnstile is one of those uh it could be one of those types of turnstiles that you have at the subway or it could be one of those taller turnstiles that has an entire locking gate and uh question is which type of physical security is it so let's look at the answers first a man trap that looks good to me but we'll look at the rest of the answers of course biometrics entry control roster and cipher lock well again the best answer here looks like man trap and that is the correct answer if you have one of those taller turnstiles that has all those bars generally what that will do is one of two things one it'll allow you to exit and not go any further or two it'll allow you access to an area that you can't get out of without further authentication or you may have to use authentication while inside the turnstile and it'll lock if your authentication is denied uh, another example of a man trap would be a room that has two doors and so you might ha have a room and it has an entry which you can get into no problem but then there's a second door and in order to get past the second door there's going to be some type of scanning system maybe a proximity card reader or other type of system and if you can't get past that this door will lock and this door will already be locked and you'll be stuck in here and you won't be able to get back out and you never know there might be a video camera or there might be a guard sitting here looking through glass at you and so if you get stuck and you can't get through you will be interrogated under bright lights uh well it depends on the company generally the guard or another admin or someone will come in a security person and check your id and see what the problem is and if you're not authorized then you'll be escorted out and possibly the authorities notified if you are supposed to be authorized, you know, we'll, we'll fix the problem at that point. But the whole idea is that it's a man trap. It's supposed to trap people in there who are not authorized to get past into secure areas of the building. And so a turnstile could do this also. Um, it could be limited in its ability to trap the person depends on the type of turnstile. So that's going to be the best answer. Now, biometrics is a type of physical security but it also incorporates uh, systems as well it's based off of uh, a person's characteristics their physical characteristics so for example you might need to use a uh, thumbprint you might need to scan your thumb when you're trying to access here into the building and you might need that in conjunction with a proximity card you never know uh, entry control roster that's not correct because that's something that will actually be a list and the guard might have a list of people who are allowed to be to access the uh, secure areas of the building and that could be written or it could be on the system so that's going to be a roster that a guard or a computer will check a cipher lock is just a different type of lock you might have a lock on the door 
the cipher lock, you actually have to push the buttons for the numbers and uh, type in the uh, punch in the right code to get past that door. And so these are all things that deal with security. And they're all things that deal with physical security to a certain extent. But the man trap is what a turnstile is going to be part of. That's the turnstile will be uh, under the category of man trap. But in most companies, you'll have this type of setup where you have an actual room that can trap the person in there. And this is meant to defeat things like piggybacking, where one person tries to access the building with another person, uh, also known as tailgating. So that's question three. A little bit of an easier question, but still you want to be able to identify the correct answer and why the incorrect answers are incorrect. Question four. A computer displays pop-ups when connected to the internet. After you update the system and run an anti-malware application, the problem continues and you find that two rogue processes cannot be terminated. What should you do next to troubleshoot the problem? Let's look at the possible answers. A. Run the event viewer to identify the cause. B. Run MS config to clean boot the computer. C. Use the recovery console to kill the processes. Or D. Use system restore to revert the system to a previous state. Now this is a little bit more complex. It's showing a lot of the applications that you might use in Windows to troubleshoot the problem. And this is key for the real exam and for the field. You know, this is what you're going to be doing. You're going to be troubleshooting problems like this in Windows. And the correct answer here is going to be B, run MS config to clean boot the system. Let's take a look at the question a little bit more in depth here. Now, first of all, it says the computer is displaying pop-ups when connected to the internet. So we've identified the problem. Uh, after you update the system and you run your anti-malware, so you've already tried these things, the problem continues. And you find that two rogue processes cannot be terminated, which means you tried to terminate them, but it wouldn't work. And so what should you do next to troubleshoot the problem? You know, this looks like a malware issue. It looks like it's possibly viruses or something other, otherwise malware related. And you ran the anti-malware application, but it doesn't seem to work. And you can't terminate those processes. When you can't terminate a process, you know, first you want to make sure you're logged on as an admin so that you could do the termination of those. But if you can't do it at that point, then, you know, chances are this is some type of virus or some type of malware on your system. So the best answer here is to run MS config to clean boot the system. And so let's show MS config here now. And here's system configuration. We showed this previously in the video. Uh, you can go to run and type MS config to open this. It's a system, system configuration utility. And from here to clean boot the system, you'd go to boot and choose safe boot and, choose, and leave the default as minimal. And this way it's going to minimize everything that runs, uh, it, the least amount of services and drivers and so on. You could also go to services and disable all of them and that would boot the guy at the selective startup, and you could deselect system services here as well if you needed to. You don't want to run it as normal startup. You want to run the least amount of services possible and run in safe boot mode. And this way, you can clean boot that computer. That's what this phrase means, run msconfig to clean boot the computer. The other option is to run it in safe mode from the advanced boot options menu in Windows 7 or earlier, or the startup settings in Windows 8 or newer. And it's the same thing though, you wanna run in safe mode. And you can get to that by pressing F8 when the computer boots, uh, or from the uh, disk in Windows 8 or newer. So safe mode or safe boot in MS Config, either way, you're trying to run it in a way where there's very little in the way of drivers and very little in the way of services that could get in the way this way, you might have an easier time terminating those rogue processes, and you might have a better time scanning the system with your anti-malware. So that's the next thing that you should try. This is the next uh, theory to see if you can fix the problem. So let's look at the other answers. Uh, run the event viewer to identify the cause. Well, 
we've kind of identified the cause. We're not fully positive yet, but if we have two rogue processes that can't be terminated, chances are that we've got some type of virus on the system. So we've sort of identified the cause, but we need to kind of prove our theory a little bit further. But the event viewer isn't necessarily going to identify the cause anyway. Um, this will tell us a lot of things in the system log, but not necessarily what the problem is. And so whenever you're dealing with some type of malware issue, you want to run that uh, clean boot. You want to go safe mode or safe boot. So running the event viewer might be something to help you identify information, but uh, it may or may not give you the answer you want. At this point, we should run msconfig to clean boot the computer. The other answer is use the recovery console to kill the processes. Well, the recovery console is not really where we'd go right off the bat. Generally, you'll terminate the processes that you need to terminate within the main operating system, not within Windows recovery environment. And you would do that as an admin and the best place, the best way to do it is from safe mode, not from the recovery console. Plus the recovery console is actually a Windows XP thing. Uh, you know, nowadays it's known as the command prompt within your uh, Windows recovery environments. So that's definitely not correct for a variety of reasons. And then D, use system restore to revert the system to a previous state. It's a little premature to do that. We're not sure that we need to do that at this point. We might, but really what you want to do is disable system restore and then go into safe mode and then see if you can get rid of those processes. You might, you might also need to remove files from Windows Explorer or File Explorer and you might need to uh, remove entries from the registry and then do another scan with your anti-malware application or a, a second anti-malware application, then reboot the system and then turn system restore back on, then you might actually have to revert back to an older restore point if the virus did damage to the system. So that's why those answers are incorrect. It ties into the A-plus troubleshooting process a little bit. Um, and also your functionality of Windows and your knowledge of Windows. So in this scenario, you want to use msconfig to do safe boot or use safe mode in uh, your startup settings or your advanced boot options. Oh, and a quick note, uh, back to the CompTIA a objectives in the 220-902 objectives, objective 4.2, best practice procedure for malware removal. You need to memorize this as well. And you have the seven steps here. Identify malware symptoms, which probably has already happened in the scenario of this question. Quarantine the infected system, then disable system restore, then remediate infected systems, which means update the anti-malware software and do additional scans and removal techniques. For example, safe mode or msconfig safe boot and uh, the pre-installation environment, the Windows recovery environment if necessary, or whatever operating system you're using, they're pre-installation environment, then schedule scans and run updates, get back into the main system, enable system restore and create a restore point and educate the end user. So you want to know the best practice procedure for malware removal and memorize that for the exam as well. Question five, a customer just downloaded a game to a company smartphone. When the person is not using the device, it unexpectedly dials unrecognized numbers and downloads new content. What is the smartphone a victim of? Well, it's a loaded question. First of all, why did the customer download a game to the company's smartphone? If this is a BYOD type of environment, they should not be doing that. And they should not have been allowed to do that. The admin should have the system locked. So we see it's unexpectedly dialing unrecognized numbers. That's not good. And downloads new content. We don't want that. So what is the smartphone a victim of? A, spyware. B, social engineering. C, Trojan horse. Or D, worms. Well, first of all, we could do the process elimination and say uh, worms. We doubt that the phone is going to be a victim of worms. <laughs> you know, maybe one worm. I'm not sure. But that's probably not going to be a good answer. So worms, we're going to get rid of that guy right off the bat. We're going to use our process of elimination to do that. 
The other ones, though, you might say, well, it could be any of these, but social engineering, well, then you're thinking more of a con artist and somebody who's trying to get your information over the phone or by email or by shoulder surfing or whatever. So we can kind of eliminate that guy too. And now it's down to spyware or Trojan horse, which type of malware. Well, here's the thing. The person downloaded a game and it could, le- it could look like a legitimate game. It could actually be a real game that the person can use. However, the game could come with something else, an extra executable, an extra program or app that's built into it. And when that's the case, that's known as a Trojan. The Trojan is something that's extra that comes with the program, or it could be by itself. It's something that looks genuine. It looks innocuous, but it actually contains something that's harmful. And so Trojan horse will be the correct answer here. You know, spyware is a possibility. You might be interested in spyware as the answer, but it's not really going to be what we want. Spyware is something that's installed to the system that watches what you do on the internet or watches what you do as you're gaming. You know, it's within the Trojan horse, there's most likely some type of virus or additional application that does all this stuff unexpectedly dials or unrecognized numbers and downloads new content, which could do all kinds of other stuff. You might get more viruses or ransomware or who knows what. So it could be real bad at that point. The whole idea here is that you shouldn't be downloading games to a smartphone. If it's a company smartphone and only download apps that are authorized, only download apps that are considered to be safe. And there's a lot of checks that you can do with that online with at your app store or at Google play. And a lot of checks that you can do with that as an admin to verify which programs are allowed to be downloaded to a smartphone or a tablet. So best answer here is going to be Trojan horse. And if a person has a smartphone or a mobile device, you want to make sure that you update those with the latest uh, anti-malware software. And if necessary, distribute those updates to all the devices. You know, you're going to have lots of devices out there. You might have smartphones and you might have tablets and whatever else. You can update all of those with an MDM or a mobile device management system. And you can do it all from your admin workstation. And you want to be able to defeat Trojan horses, but also worms and viruses and spyware and all that. So you want to update that anti-malware software. Okay, question six, bonus question. I always give bonuses. I love to give bonuses. It's just question six. Anyways, you are the admin for your organization. You just loaded Windows on a new workstation and configured it with the proper IP settings. Now the workstation needs to be added to the corporate domain. Which of the following utilities should you use to accomplish this? So scenario oriented question based on the configuration of a system to connect it to a windows domain. And let's look at the answers. A system information, B system protection, C system properties and D ethernet properties page. Well, here's one last tip for you. If you really aren't sure about the answer, one of those golden rules is you can just guess, go with your gut instinct. You know, if you go with your gut instinct and you say, Hey, I think it's uh, C system properties. You just may be right. You know, sometimes your gut instinct is something you could write down the possible answer, your gut instinct answer on paper. And then mark the question and go back to it later. And you might say, oh, yeah, that is the answer. That's easy. You know, sometimes it'll kind of jog your memory. Or you might see a question later in the test that'll help you to answer this question. So marking the question can be very helpful. And using your gut instinct can be very helpful. And as a last resort, you know, you just guess. And sometimes you can just pick C. Sometimes C is the answer, you know, just guess the answer. So in this case, system properties is correct. A lot of similar looking names, but if you know Windows, you know the answer is system properties. And then you have to go a little bit more in depth from there. 
So let's go to system properties now. First of all, we'll go to the system window here, which is from the control panel, all control panel items, system. Then you want to go to advanced system settings, and that'll bring up your system properties window. And you, I mean, you can get to this dialog box in a variety of ways. Uh, for example, you could do uh, system properties computer name.exe from the run prompt, and that'll bring you right here. And that's where you want to be. And you'd go to change. And from there, you would select domain. And then you'd need to know the name of the domain, abccompany.com or davidlprouse.com, whatever the domain is. And that's going to be based on your uh, server, your domain controller, and your DNS server. And you get that information from your admin. If you are the admin, you've already set up that uh, domain controller and DNS server, and you'll know that domain name. So that would change the system from a work group, a peer-to-peer -peer network, over to the client server domain. So that's where you'd go for that system window. And then you can, again, you can get here in a variety of ways, but ultimately you want to get to the system properties dialog box, and this is one way to get there. Now, the other answers here, system information, uh, that's not correct. If you want to open the system information window, you'd go to the run prompt and type MS Info 32. That's right, MS Info 32. And that would bring up your system information window, which gives you a summary of the system, hardware resources. Uh, you can check out IRQs and conflicts if there is any and stuff like that, old school stuff, which generally you don't do as much nowadays. You never know. I do it once uh, in a blue moon, let's put it that way. But all this information is static. It's just text information that you could look at. You can search, but you don't make any changes from here. You know, in the scenario, we need to actually make a change. We need to add the workstation to a corporate domain. So you do that in the system properties window. System protection, that means system restore. If we go back to our system window here, we'll see system protection is here. And really, if you click that link, it brings you back to that system properties dialog box, but this time to the system protection tab. And from here, you can configure system restore points and so on. So that's going to be a little bit different. This is not where you go to add the computer to a domain. That's done at the computer name tab and go to change. And then finally, the Ethernet properties page, that's networking. That's a completely different thing altogether. To get, you can get to that by going to the network and sharing center. And go to change adapter settings and that'll show a list of your adapters whether they're wired or wireless and for example i have a wired connection here called lan right click on that and go to properties and that's going to be called lan properties or in windows 7 and previous it'll be by default local area connection properties that's the name by default in windows 8 and newer they changed it to ethernet which is better because it's just one word and so the answer said Ethernet properties. Again, that's Windows 8 and newer. And there's all kinds of stuff here. You know, you have your information of what you're a client for, uh, virtual machine information, your TCP IP properties, and so on. And then you could also go to configure. And that'll bring up the connection properties for that guy. You could change the driver. You can go to advanced and you could modify flow control. And you could modify uh, if you're using jumbo packets link speed and duplex you should know all these settings for the exam as well by the way but it's a totally different thing you know you may want to configure the system to do one gigabit full duplex uh, so you can make sure that you're sending and receiving data simultaneously on the workstation at one gigabit per second you might just be able to auto negotiate and as long as your card can handle that and the switch you're connecting to can handle that it'll do it but sometimes you have to specifically set that. But this is more of a data link layer type of property. This has to do with the ethernet connection, not the application side of things with connecting to the domain. That again is done from that system properties. One more time, you can go to advanced system settings to bring up the system properties from here. You can go to computer name and change. And like I said, uh, bring up the run prompt and you could do system properties, computer name, .exe, press OK, and it brings it up automatically. It was already there, but it would have brought it up. 
So that's where you'd go, then change and change over to the domain. So make sure you know your Windows configurations. You want to know how to get through Windows. And basically this works the same way in Vista 7, 8, 10, whatever. It's, you know, your navigation might be slightly different, but all these names are the same of these uh, portions of Windows. So make sure that you understand your Windows configuration. Uh, make sure you have the ability to do that in the system. Okay, let's wrap it up. Long video, lots of stuff there, very long video. And so I hope that helped you with uh, analyzing some of these 220-902 questions. Uh, check out my A-plus books and videos, A-plus exam cram books, and the uh, complete video courses for the 220-901 and 220-902. And uh, look for my free A-plus study page on my website. That's got a lot of tips that I add to periodically. It also has a little 10-question uh, quiz for each of the exams and uh, my A-plus video playlist uh, from YouTube. So check that out. That's all free on the A-plus study page on my website, www.davidlprouse.com. And remember the tips that we talked about. Read through the entire question carefully. Look at all the answers. Don't just jump on one answer. Look at all the answers. Know why the correct answer is correct, but also why the incorrect answers are incorrect. And when you're studying, consider using flashcards and reverse engineering the question. And when you're taking the real exam, use the process of elimination if necessary. And that disprove theory, you know, eliminate ones that you think are definitely incorrect right off the bat. And if you have to, go with your gut instinct. And one of the key things here, be confident. If you study hard and you practice on your systems, and you really know this stuff, then you, all you have to do at that point is be confident and you'll pass the exam. If you've studied properly and you go through all the checklists that I give in my books and my videos, you know, you will succeed. Be persistent, be confident, and you will succeed. So that's it. Until the next video, good luck with your exams.